أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد So brothers and sisters, in Islam, as we mentioned prior, we're allowed to ask questions if the, the purpose of the question is for education, edification, to know so that we can submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. What is not permissible is asking questions to dispute, to disagree, and to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes some Muslims engage in a lot of questioning, but not for the purpose of learning, but for the purpose of just arguing with other people. So we should avoid that because Allah asked us not to do that. In Surah Al-Baqarah, we, received, we see a series of questions. Just because they occur the way they, are, they do in the verses, does, does, that does not necessarily indicate that that's the sequence of how people asked about these issues, okay? It's just that in recitation order, that's how this ayat occur. And the first question that was asked was about Allah. When you make dua, should you yell, raise your voice? Is Allah so far that you have to raise your voice or is he near where you have to whisper? You know, does Allah hear us at all? So sometimes we all have these questions and Allah supplied the answer. And we talked about the conditions for accepting dua. Like the Prophet Sallallahu states in this hadith, Mamim Muslim, Yad'ullah Azza wa Jalla bi da'wah, Laysa fiha ithm, Wala qati'atu rahim, Illa a'tahu Allah biha, Ihda salati khisar. If you make any person who makes a dua, any Muslim makes a dua to Allah, and this dua does not involve a sin or to cut off family ties, Allah will respond to it in either of three ways to either advance it, defer it, or give you a replacement for it. Okay? So that's where, why that question was asked as a refresher. So this is a very interesting dua. Um, you know, a hadith. Remember it because that way you don't become disappointed when you make a beautiful dua to Allah for something and you don't see the result of the dua because maybe Allah is keeping it for you for the akhirah or for the future or Allah is saving you from something horrible coming your way. Question number two was, yes, alunaka anil ahilla. People are asking about the hilal. What is it for? Allah says it, it, what, it, it's what marks the time periods for us for doing certain things and the hajj. So fasting and hajj are primarily the two major acts of worship that require for us to know the beginning, end, or middle of the month. Normally, many acts of worship are not based on the moon, except fasting and hajj. And we already said, and also to be aware of the sacred months. So because of these three, fasting, hajj, and ashahrul haram, you and I need to be able to track eight of the 12 months. Remember, we mentioned that. You need to be able to track... Um, the months that precede the months of fasting, hajj, and the sacred months, and the actual months themselves. So in order for you to find out when Ramadan starts, you need to know when Sha'ban starts. Mm -hmm. um, and prior to Sha'ban, you have Rajab. Rajab is a sacred month, so you need to know uh, Jumada al-Akhirah, the month prior to that, so you don't violate the sacred month. So <laughs> you will need to know Jumada, al akhira Rajab, Sha'ban, Ramadan, Shawwal, dhul qada dhul hijjah and Muharram. Eight out of the 12, you, I mean, many Muslims need to be able to track them. But we only focus on Ramadan and Hajj to make dispute and fight each other and talk about what is citing or not and is calculation or not, yada, yada, yada. Let's stop doing that. All right, question number three. Let's get to question number three. This is where we stopped. Yes, alunaka, madha yunfikun. They are asking you what, you know, about what they spend. Madha yunfikun. But the, the nature of the question, based on the answer, we can infer, we can make an inference. We can figure out what the actual question was based on what the answer Allah supplies. Qul ma anfaqtum min khayrin falil walidayni wal akrabina bil ma'roof. So all these are categories of people supposed to receive sadaqah, in general sadaqah, 
you know, that good spending out of your heart. But when it comes to zakat, parents are excluded. The point here is, the nature of the question is, who should you give sadaqa? We're making that inference from the answer. To the parents, your close relatives, the orphans, and the poor, and the wayfarer. So these are the people that should receive sadaqa in general. But later on in Surah Tawbah, Allah removed parents from it because they're supposed to receive help and assistance from their children and so on and so forth. And then we explained the difference between a nafaka, just the act of giving is called nafaka. And, you know, or any expenditure is a nafaka. Yunfikuna means you're spending it. The sadaqa is what you spend freely from your heart, fisabilillah. Could be as little, could be a lot. But a zakah is what you have saved for a year in assets that you must spend that 2.5%. We determined the 2.5% because the Prophet Sallallahu said it's a quarter of a tenth. So that's where the 2.5% comes. So somebody asked me about the hadith, about that after the call. Um, so I provided that reference. I'm going to try to bring that reference back here so that way everybody will see that reference. Where do we get this 2.5? It doesn't say 2.5% in the Quran. No, it doesn't. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal in Quran a pillar or a principle and then instructs the Prophet Sallallahu to teach us its implementation. So if Allah just says 2.5%, it wouldn't make sense in the Quran to a Bedouin. I mean, what's, what are percentages? So you know, 1400 years ago, people don't deal with percentages. Well, people understood proportions, ratios and proportions. That's why the the inheritance laws in Surah Nisa, they're based on ratios and proportions and not percentages. Long story short, it came from a hadith where the Prophet explained that from like silver or gold, you need a fourth of from that tenth. So that's how it becomes 2.5%. That 2.5% zakat to purify your wealth should only go to the poor and the needy as we stated. So nafaka is any expense. Sadaqa is spending it for for the sake of Allah to help somebody. So when you gas your car, it's a nafaka. <laughs> it's an expenditure. When you gas somebody's car, it is a sadaka. Okay? And when you fulfill your requirement of that, that 2.5%, you take it out of your wealth to give to the poor, that is zakah. So sometimes you spend, you, you give sadaka a whole year, but you don't save enough to pay zakah. That's fine. Zakah is based on assets and wealth that you have saved for a year. But because we use bank accounts, checking accounts that have revolving money in and out, it is hard to know which monies have been saved for a year. So some people make it easy on themselves. Whatever is in their bank account after a year, based on a certain anniversary, Ramadan to Ramadan, Hajj to Hajj, Arafah to Arafah, they take 2.5% from that. It's valid. Because it's hard to split hairs with digital money. You know, your money in your bank account is not printed money sitting somewhere. Your employer direct deposits virtual funds to your account. It's it's only a transaction in a database, technically speaking. It only becomes money when you go to the ATM and withdraw it. Those virtual funds you can buy against it by using your credit card. So because the monetary system is different, it's kind of hard to just put our heads around it. But Allah knows best. I hope that sheds some light upon how you can go about handling. But if you have a savings account, that's easy. And we said that scholars believe that investment accounts, you don't pay zakah upon them until you collect on the investment. And Allah knows best because it's a general principle that something that is being invested, you don't actually, because they're not assets you currently have, so you don't pay on those. All right. And then Surah Tawbah, ayah number 60, says that. The required, so required sadaqah is what is called zakah. And that should only go to skin, I mean, those who handle it, and those who are, make sure those people's hearts incline towards Islam, and so on and so forth. So this is question number three where we start. Now, question number four. Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 217. So this is where we'll continue from. And I believe that we will continue up to question number six and, we, and we'll save question number seven 
it's a deeper question for the sisters especially. We'll save it for Wednesday, inshallah. And that light the load on my throat beat me left. So question number seven goes, I mean question number four. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم يسألونك عن الشهر الحرام قتال فيه They are asking you about the sacred months fighting in the sacred months So who is asking about fighting in the sacred months? So there's a story about that So let me just read the rest of it If you notice the eye is very long It's not a small eye It reads Fighting in the sacred months is a huge matter. However, however, that yes, fighting in the sacred months is Allah says is bad. However, worse than that is preventing people from Islam. Wakufrum bih, and then disbelieving Allah, and then preventing people from coming to Masjid al-Haram and leaving idols there, and expelling people from Mecca is worse to Allah than fighting in the sacred months. And then Allah says, Wal fitna tu akbaru min al qatil. The fitna that the Quraysh are spreading is worse than this fighting that they're decrying. And Allah says, so Allah seems to be defending someone or something here. They will never fail. They will never stop trying to do what? They will never stop fighting you. Until you have turned back from your religion by their efforts. Whoever turns back on his religion, you die upon that. Ridda, this is what we call uh, Ridda, or so you hear someone say, Murtad, is somebody who abandoned Islam, say, you know what, this religion is for me, I renounce it. Allah says, whoever dies that way, let me go back to it. If you die an apostate, Allah says, all your previous salah, zakah, siyam, will all be nullified. In this world and in the hereafter. So, why are people asking about the sacred ones? There's a story to this, that the Prophet ﷺ organized a small batch of Muslims to go in what they call a sariya, in a small mission. But he gave instructions to the Amir. He gave him some written instructions. He says, when you get to a certain place, read these instructions. SubhanAllah, it's very interesting that here, they, I'm giving you these instructions, don't read it yet. When you get to a certain place, read the instructions and then give a choice to whoever is with you to either continue with you or not. Okay? So the instructions simply to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell us, yeah, do not force anybody to follow you beyond this point. So when they got there, they read the instructions. When they did, some, you know, one or two of them decided, I'm going to not follow. So they, they, they went back and that was perfectly fine. They were intercepting a caravan of Quraysh or something from Quraysh. It turns out that this took place close to the time of one of the sacred months. And a day or, or so was so close. So when they decided to attack this group of, you know, Quraysh, and they killed one of them, they got, Quraysh started blaming the Muslims that, oh, you violated the sacred months. So imagine Quraysh blocked people from Masjid al-Haram. They expelled the Prophet ﷺ and the believers. They are spreading disbelief. They're the ones who are decrying violation of the sacred months. When those companions came back to al Madina and word spread that they had attacked, the Prophet ﷺ said, I did not order you to go fight in the sacred months. So these companions, they felt they were going to die now because they did something that was a violation of the law of Allah, regardless if it was Quraysh. Then Allah revealed this ayah, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِي then Allah says, yes, fighting it is bad, but what Quraysh is doing is worse. And 
it turned out that they were not really fighting in it was they were just like one day shy of it and Allah knows best so what are the sacred months Allah revealed in surat at tawbah about the idea that they are sacred months. Now, this is not a new idea. The idea has existed as long as Quraysh could go. And that is Allah states in um, at Tawban 36. Inna Allah. Allah says the number of months to Allah is na ashara shahra. 12 months. Fi kitab yawma khalaqa samawati wal ard minha arba'atun hurum. Allah says that he had designated four months out of the 12 to be sacred and that nobody should violate these months Allah says don't violate that don't wrong yourselves don't wrong other people don't be committing sins these are sacred months because three of them are months of hajj you know at least Dhul Qa'id and Dhul Hijjah are months of Hajj. Muharram is the first of the months and it is a sacred month that's why it's called Muharram and then Rajab so Allah did not say these specific months by name. It's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that tells us what these sacred months are. Infamous hadith that during the Prophet Sallallahu final hajj, al-hajjat al-wada, he said to the people, "Ala inna zamana qad istadara kahayatihi yoma khalaq Allah al-samawat wal-ard minha," and then he says, "Al-shahr ithna ashra shahra." Minha Arbatun Hurum. It says, Time has returned back to the way it was supposed to be the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth. That the year has 12 months. Asanatuthna Ashara Shahra. Minha Arbatun Hurum. The year has 12 months, and from them, four of them are sacred. He said, Thalathatun Mutawaliyat. Three of them are consecutive, they follow each other. And he said, That's Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah. والمحرم ورجب مضار الذي بين جمادة وشعبان. And he says, and this is the Rajab of Mudar, the, the Rajab that is between, you know, Jumad and Shaaban. There's a tribe called Mudar. So, the Prophet ﷺ said these are the ones. And Quraysh knew this, even pre-Islamic Jahiliya times, they used to uphold this. But when Quraysh wanted to fight a war, they do what we call an nasi. Allah says in the next ayah in Surah. Uh, I'll, I'll tell by here, Inna ziyadatun fil kufr. The additional kufr that they had was, Quraysh would, would say, oh no, this is not a sacred month yet. They would play around with them by flipping them around, say, oh no, this next month is not Rajab. It is something else. You see? So they will arbitrarily, if they want to fight a war, say, no, next month is not a sacred month. But then when the Muslims kill one of them close to the month, they say, oh, look at these Muslims, they're violating the sanctity of the months. So that's why I was actually criticizing them and exonerating those believers. They were like, whew, you know, close call. Okay, any questions about the sacred months? These are the sacred months. The Qa'da, the Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. In this four months, please... Yourself not to be sinful. Yes, go ahead. Islam. I have a question um, about the zakah. It's a brief question. If you have a, if you don't be able to save for the entire year from Ramadan to Ramadan, mm -hmm. and um, you want to pay zakah, even though you didn't be able to save it for the year, you don't pay zakah you if you're unable to save money. You have to have saved up to the nisab, about five hundred plus dollars. Okay. It's about 85 so, grams of gold, so whatever that price is, that makes the nisab, okay. uh, scholars say. Yeah, so for example, let's say you work $100,000 a year, gross. You know, you pay taxes, you pay social security, blah, blah, blah. You have rent, you have car note, you have all sorts of fees and stuff. Food. At the end of the year, you only have $250 in your account. There's no zakat to pay under $250. You have to have enough to have met the nisab, the minimum requirement. So let's say at the end of the year, you have $1,000. Mm -hmm. So you pay zakah actually on the amount, uh, spoiler alert. Oh, There's okay. a question. You pay on the amount above the nisab. So if you had, a, let's say if you had $1,000 in your, in your account, but mm -hmm. the nisab is 500. Mm -hmm. So anything above the 500 or above that extra is what mm -hmm. you actually pay zakah on. So you give it to the five percent on five hundred, not a thousand. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Allah is merciful. 
Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I'm not trying to impoverish anybody here. Okay. <laughs> it's a small amount. If you think about it, yeah. Zakat mm-hmm. on on a thousand bucks is twenty five dollars. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, because during the year I cannot save. If I say I can't save for, um five thousand this year to next you year, you live paycheck to paycheck. So paycheck, whatever comes exactly. in goes out. It comes in okay. goes out. It's mm-hmm. only a small amount residual small that amount remains amount. every month. Okay. Exactly. If you yeah. notice, you only have a small residual amount mm-hmm. every month. Allah is merciful. Allah who I oh, okay. Question. Before we get to question yes, number. So you should yes. look for both the checking and savings, whatever. Yes. yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Checkings and savings. Anything that is cash on your hand. And jewelry, sisters. Yes, you should pay zakat on your jewelries if you have a ton of it. Yes. Wow. Yes, because you Ooh. see, a lot of women hoard wealth in the form of gold. You pay zakat on all your assets. You give it as either gold or you give a monetary value of it, whatever it is. So scholars say that if you have gold that you use personally, frequently, that doesn't count. It's the one that you just hoard. And there's some Muslim women, they have amassed a lot of gold for the rainy day because they go and say they have to pay zakat on gold. So we'll talk about all those details mm-hmm. when we get to, yes, more ayat about zakat. What should you be paying on you pay zakat even on produce if you're a farmer you pay mm. zakat on your harvest mm. in fact you're supposed to even pay the zakat on your produce when you harvest it <laughs> yeah not later later you know you harvest you give back to it a lot because it's the right of the poor that's how it is so more details when we get to Surat al and parts of Anissa, and when you get to sort at Tawbah, inshallah. So today's money makers. Imam, is, yes. One um, question about the jewelry side. It yes. should specifically be gold, not other jewelry that we buy, right? I well, get this good question. At the time this was revealed, the only precious metals were gold and silver. So, for example, the people didn't see diamonds as precious. By the way, diamonds are not precious. We made them precious to sell rings technically speaking. Mm. Yeah, it, it's an artificial precious stone, meaning mm. that it, it, we, we've, we made that precious 200 years ago or something, yeah. <laughs> Before nobody was killing until now, half of the population of Sierra Leone got killed because of blood diamonds. Mm. We don't use the diamonds in Sierra Leone. It's someone else who thinks it's precious that was buying it illegally, fueling a civil war like the beer and all the others. But yeah, so, so scholars say specifically it's stuff like gold and silver, diamonds, is question like platinum. Platinum is special metal today, but it wasn't at the time of the prophecy. It wasn't the time this was revealed. So I'll look into see if they have modified any of these categories. But gold and silver, clear. Outside of those, it's unclear as to how do you pay zakat on something that is contemporarily precious. Let's see. Brother, I have a question regarding the bow. That you said that women have a women have a jewelry that daily they wearing, but since that they are living in we are living in Western, there's not no need so much to wear those jewelry. Yes. The people do. You just don't know that they do. So yes. So some women they wear jewelry frequently at home. Every my question, day. yeah, my question is that if they are not wearing and they, their income is not that much, still they have to pay for zakat for the, for the jewelry. Yeah. So if you have jewelry that you are not using and regardless of your income, if it's over a certain amount, yes, you should be paying zakat on it. Because again, imagine you don't use it, but you're not using it another way so for example let's say someone doesn't have enough income but they're not selling the gold to get income they're just keeping it for a rainy day so it, it would depend also on the person's financial situation because sometimes a person has a financial need for them to receive zakat although they have gold <laughs> but we'll split those hairs when we get to that so it just we just want to talk generally on the principle that if you have too much gold you should be paying zakat on it uh, but the, the gold that you use frequently Scholars say, no, that's exempt because for, for general use. But in the West now, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, I work, but I don't work enough. I'm supposed to be a Zakat recipient regardless of how much gold I have. Those are things we have to explore more, inshallah, okay? I mean, not the, 
the, I'm sorry to, my question is that not wearing the jewelry. I know, and that's what I'm addressing it. If okay. you have a lot of gold that meets the nisab and you're not using it, you are to pay zakat on it. And how much is zakat for that? It's very small, 2.5%. Okay. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. We're going to get to more of those kind of, because there's a question asked, what do you, which amount do you pay out of? Okay. That's why scholars have this. this yeah, small. but I, I want to hear, I want to understand that how much is man <laughs> per man? You said 20, $25? 2.5% is the zakat you pay on gold and silver and money. Okay. Thank you so much. 0.5%. Well, yeah. All right. So, the uh, next question, actually there are two questions embedded in number five. So I'm, I broke it down to 5A and 5B. So 5B is in reference to question number, uh, the one about spending, question number three. So, so I mean, somebody had a follow-up question about it, okay? So today's money makers, they're asking about today's money makers. So what are today's money makers mm. so here are today's money makers question 5a is I'm referring to specifically and there's a 5b in here allah says yes to um surah al-baqarah ayah 219 yes wal maisir. they're asking you about khamr and al maisir al khamr and al maisir so the answer is qul don't forget, brothers and sisters, in six of the seven questions, Allah says, just say exactly this, including the seventh one, the first one. Allah provides the answer. So what is the answer? If you, if you ask the Prophet ﷺ about gambling and alcohol, Allah says, قُلْ فِيهِمَا In both of them, so follow the logic of the answer. Word for word, brothers and sisters, let's walk, toward, walk through this together. قُلْ say. Fihima in both of these two. So the answer addressed both of the same things. Although, see, it's a single question that asked about two things. Yes, alunaka anil khamri wal maisir. Khamr and al maisir. Allah says in both of them, fihima ismun kabir. In both of them, there is great sin. Wamana fi'ulin nas and their benefits for mankind. Wa ifmuhuma, but both of their sin, akbaru min nafihima. Both of their sin are greater than their benefits. And in the same ayah, wa yasalu nakamada yunfikun. And they ask you again, what do I spend from? Allah says, kuli lafu. So, sister, going back, Rosemary, to your question, what do I spend from? Allah says, kuli lafu. The extra, the excess amount you have. You see? So if anybody has excess amount beyond their needs, that's the general principle that zakah is paid on the excess that you have beyond your needs. If you have needs, then use your assets for your needs. And what's beyond your needs, that means that is a certain amount you pay zakah from. So say it is the extra. And the next ayah is also another question, but let's take this one first, inshallah. There we go. So, the money makers. Yes, alunaka anil khamri wal maisir. So, al khamr and al maisir. So, first, let's understand these two terms al khamr and al maisir. So, khamr, you see this term plenty used in the Quran. Khamr. So khamr is a term that refers to alcohol in general. But the most common alcohol that is associated with it is wine because wine used to be commonly made thousands of years. People have been making wine. Now we have other types of spirits, we call them, like brandy and whiskey and gin, this hard stuff and vodka. But wine is known that you ferment grapes and some other sugary Fruits, you can get wine. You can make wine out of anything that has a sugar or carbohydrate in it. That's how alcohol is made. But the most common thing they use is dates and grapes. You can have rice wine, palm wine back home. So in Quran, Allah uses khamr 
and another term, sakar. So what's the difference between so khamr refers to the substance that is the in, uh, that is the alcoholic substance, the drink, like wine. The Quran doesn't keep making distinction between wine and beer. They all khamr, and then sakara, the effect of it, intoxication. And there's an ayah in Surah Al-Nahl that uses وَمِنْ ثَمَرَاتِ النَّخِيلِ وَالْأَعْنَابِ تَتَّخِذُونَ مِنْهُ سَكَرَ وَرِزْقًا حَسَنًا Allah says from the fruits of dates and grapes you make تَتَّخِذُونَ مِنْهُ سَكَرَ You make intoxicants from them. But they are رِزْقًا حَسَنًا So Allah tells us that in the evolution of the prohibition Allah tells us that hey, you have grapes and you have dates these are risk and hasana this is halal risk for you but you human beings take it and convert it into something haram because of this sakar this intoxication that's why in surah al-hajj allah says wa nasa sukara wa ma hum bi sukara so allah identifies that khamr as a substance can have the effect of sakara intoxication that's why they used interchangeably in the quran they refer to each other in different contexts. So, the khamr, it's wine, it's an alcoholic drink, and or an intoxicant, as in sakara. So, sometimes, one time I got a question from a person that says, Brother, the Quran says wine is haram, but what about beer and vodka? It doesn't say anything about that. So, does that mean I should, I should be able to drink wine, um, beer, and vodka? <laughs> but Allah did not need to enumerate all the modern alcoholic drinks to say there. That's why Allah says intoxicants are haram. Now, if you look at this khamr, in general, these are the two terms used in the Quran, as I mentioned, khamr and sakara. It is mentioned over 12 times in Quran. In Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, you'll see that, you know, and when Allah made it finally prohibited, you find it in Surah Yusuf, it's mentioned, Surah Al-Nahl. But khamr is not always mentioned in a bad sense in a negative connotation it's not always mentioned can somebody give me an example when allah mentioned of allah mentioning wine and and alcohol but in a good way can anybody give us an example of a reference in quran where wine is mentioned in a good way in heaven that we can have a river in jannah Exactly. Not only that, there's several places. So Surah Muhammad, you also have it in Surah like uh, Safat, you know. You also have it like Surah Al Insan. So Allah talks about different types of drinks in Jannah, which Allah said do not cause intoxication or drunkenness in surat al-waqi'ah what does allah says ويطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون باكواب وباريق وكاس من معين لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون so in surat al-waqi'ah allah says we get drinks in jannah that are supposed to be like alcoholic drinks but they don't cause intoxication so Quran mentions it in a good context in the Akhirah only. And Allah says in the Akhirah there is no intoxication. So Allah's point to us is, brothers and sisters, Allah is saying, do not drink alcohol in dunya. If you do, you will be deprived it in the Akhirah. You know what that means? You will end up in hellfire if you don't make tawbah from it. If you don't repent and stop. See, Allah says, I, I, I promise you, Khamar, Allah is telling us. Allah says, I have, an, I have rivers, not a river in Jannah. Allah says, I have created for you rivers of different types of alcohols. Different types. If you notice, Allah described different drinks in Quran. The drinks in Surah Al-Insan are different than the one that's mentioned in Waqia, in one that is mentioned slightly in uh Surat so As-Safat and the one in Surat Muhammad, just the rivers. And Allah says, they're delicious. Let that in the shari be in Surat As-Safat. So, you know, khamr is used both in a good and a bad way. In dunya, what Allah associates bad with khamr is intoxication. Sakara. La taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. 
you see so understand why the concept of its prohibition although it was a gradual prohibition Allah tells us why because if you make hamr in dunya the alcohol when you metabolize it has many harmful effects we're going to talk about let's go to al-maisir 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 is generally gambling it's any game of chance it's anything that is acquired easily that's why funnily al-maisir as a word its root is similar to being easy for in the malusri yusra okay yasara means something to make something easier a lot al maisir look at this word a vowel can change the meaning of the of the word is anybody on this call that speaks arabia if you do just type yes or you can just unmute and say yes because I want, I, want, I want to engage you also a little bit for you to help us non-Arabic speakers. I'm not an Arabic speaker. My mother tongue isn't Arabic, nor English, nor French. <laughs> it's <Yes>. something else. <laughs> so, Al-Maisir and Maisar. What's the difference between Maisir and Maisar? And if you write both words, the difference here is a vowel. Maisir and Maisar. SubhanAllah. Because one indicates ease, the other one is gambling. Brothers and sisters, when you make money from gambling, how do you get that money? It's other people's money that you basically Yeah, you don't earn it. It's easy money, right? You see how the word for gambling is easy money. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, if somebody's in debt, give them chance. Wa in kana du usratin, See how the word, same word, different vowel, makes it means ease or easy money. That's the beauty of the language, brothers and sisters. Same amount of letters in the word. The only difference is the vowel in one of the letters. Maysir, so on the scene, it's either a fatha or a kasra. Maysar means easy. Maysir, easy money. You remember when the, the national jackpot came close to a billion dollars? It was like, what, 890 million? <laughs> and remember, somebody won it. Imagine somebody earning that much money in like this. It was just a bunch of lucky numbers. That's why the word al-maysir refers to not only gambling, but any game of chance and also anything that involves easy money. Could be gambling, because you use chance to get the fortune. It's chance to get fortune, easy. That's why it's called, and Allahu A'lam, Al-Maysir, similar to Maysar. Allahu Akbar. It's mentioned in Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, here, Yasaluna Kan al Khamr al Maisir. It's also mentioned, referenced in Surah Al Ma'idah 1991. Ya Yon Ladina Amanu in Namal Khamru, Wal Maisir, Wal Ansab, Wal Islam, Rich Sumin Amali Shaytan, Fajdani Book. Let's get some details about this. And I think this is the last question we should deal with today. So that way I can save the rest of my throat for Wednesday. So let's dissect it. Yasaluna Kan al Khamr al Maisir. Brothers and sisters, point number one. The first thing that Allah mentions about alcohol and gambling is their sin and their harm. He says, Kul fihima, say in both of them, ifmun kabir. That's the first thing Allah says. If they ask you about these two things, they are harmful. Point blank. They are harmful. Kul fihima, ifmun kabir. And Allah says, وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ I want us to get deeper into this eye. It's a beautiful eye. Linguistically, those that know Arabia would would notice something. Fihima ithmun kabir. When you hear the word ithm, sin, or it could refer to something harmful, sin or harmful. Which form is this word in the noun here in terms of numbering? Ithmun is al mufrad. Right? Those who speak Arabic. It's, it's, if you look at al-mufrad, wal-muthanna, wal-jama. It is mufrad. It is singular. Right? Those who speak Arabic on the call. Ithm is a singular word. Right? Yes. And in plural, it will be atham. We agree. 
Yes, true. There's something powerful about this. And, and I need for you to stay with me. I need for you to continue to, to, to give us the, the affirmations. Fihima if moon kabir. Allah says, so let's say Allah is saying one sin. But when Allah says benefit, He says, is it mufrad or al jamma? Al jamma, plural. Exactly. The benefits are plural, but the sin is singular. Manafia. Manfa would be the singular. Allah is powerful. Allahu Akbar, people say Allahu Akbar. Here mm -hmm. comes the thing. Allah is making a logical argument. Allah says, Khamr and Maisir, they have their singular sin. What does that make you conclude? What is Allah saying here? Benefits, one sin, sin greater than benefit. What does that tell you? There's it's a horrible sin and oh. the benefit exactly that all their benefits are outweighed by just one of their harms subhanallah this is how allah leaves what we call an implicit prohibition allah does not explicitly say fajitanibu here so I have another lecture. Uh, one of our sessions will be about the gradual prohibition. I didn't want to bring it here because we have to have an eye in Surat Al-Nisa and an eye in Surat Al-Ma'idah. So I'll deal with it in Surat Al-Ma'idah. I just want you to know that Allah is saying, yes, Allah says alcohol and gambling have some benefits to people. Guess what? People make money out of it, right? So that's a benefit. People will say, if you gamble, you find some excitement in it until you lose your money. <laughs> if you drink alcohol, you find yourself to be happy until you get a hangover. You notice that in both of them, you have a small benefit and the repercussions. Most people who gamble lose their money. Brothers and sisters, what happens when 200 million people in America play the lottery? Who wins it? Is it all 200 million? Who wins the lottery? How many people One. usually win? Normally one or sometimes rarely two. That's it. So everyone else is a loser. They lost their money. If you go to Las Vegas, you gamble, most people lose their money. So only one person gets the benefit or <laughs> few. And the benefit is temporary until somebody kills them for the money, until their life becomes miserable. All those people who won the Powerball had miserable lives. Actually, somebody followed them and, and see what happened to their lives. Their lives became horrible. Alcohol is the same. When you drink it, you get a temporary enjoyment out of it. And then the permanent effects are coming. So look how Allah puts it linguistically. The one sin, singular here, ithm, kabir, manafir, benefits, kathir, wa ithmuhuma akbaru min nafihima. The, the sin trumps the benefit not all of its sins just one aspect of its sin we're going to see that number two that allah expresses harm in singular and benefits in plural making the irrefutable case that no matter how many benefits you guys are going to go find allah is saying they don't count they are outweighed by the singular harm gambling industry the gaming industry you know how much money they make every year in the united states 240 billion and they employ 1.7 million people in 40 states Alcohol, 253 billion. That's just in 2018. And they expect it to get to 1.3 trillion. Subhanallah. Very soon. Actually, it's actually more than that. Globally, it is 1.3 trillion, the entire alcohol industry in the world. It is going to become 1.8 trillion soon by 2026. Makes a lot of money. Imagine that. Billions and trillions we're talking here. But what is the harm? Someone can say, well, you know, a little wine is good for the heart. Have you ever heard the statement, a little wine is good for the heart? Have you ever heard that statement before? Yes. TV and ad, oh. Everybody says, it. a little alcohol is good for you. Okay. I'll have mm -hmm. you know that the alcohol industry funded the research, biased statistical research that says that because something like red wine, they have an increase in the molecules that help the development of HDL the high-density kind of uh, lipids that are good, good cholesterol. So that could have a positive effect on lowering 
the effect of cholesterol. See, it's like, oh, it's a correlational study, not a causational study. There's no study that says if you drink this, you become healthy this way. It is that, oh, because alcohol does this to a small degree, let's look at what the experts are now saying. Take a look at the human body on the right side of the screen. The long-term effects of drinking. This is medical irrefutable facts now. Alcohol can harm all of these parts of your body. On the throat and on the mouth and the, tro and the, tro and the throat and the voice box, you can have cancers of the esophagus and the pharynx and the larynx. You could have cancers of that. Even when you drink alcohol, it may cause inflammation for your lungs. It can cause breast cancer in some people. Liver damage, the cirrhosis of the liver as the liver metabolizes the ethanol and whatever type of other alcohol molecules. It damages the liver. So that's why your liver gets scarred over time, become inflamed, cause cirrhosis of the liver and liver cancer as well. In your blood and immune system, it can, by the way, Alcohol is not a stimulant. It is a depressant. It depresses your nervous system. That's why you, you get slurred speech, slow responses, cannot walk on a straight line. It is damaged. That's why I call it saccharin. It has so many bad, it destroys bone marrow, you name it. Countless studies you've heard. Oh, alcohol is good for the wine. A glass of wine is good for the heart. They did a major global study over many, many countries. And this was documented in The Lancet. And this was published. At the UK, I think it was at the UK that actually did the study. It completely debunked the idea that there's some moderate drinking is a good thing. In fact, their conclusion, these researchers said, no amount of alcohol is safe. They pretty much that's what they say. Look, and I quote them down here. Our results show that the safest level of drinking is zero. Because oh, how do you judge safety here? Okay, one glass for this one person could be too much for another person. If a person takes a glass a day, well, some people get horribly <laughs> sick from it while some people don't. So as a researcher, they said, <laughs> there's no known safety level. The safety is zero. If you don't drink it, fine. If you drink it, something bad will happen to you at some point in time. This, and CNN covered this a lot in our NPR. Major news outlets all covered it. It was a, it's a major... Uh, research that was done studying tens of thousands of people from different countries to see the impact of alcohol on people. It is greatly impactful, Allah says. If, just the one, if muhuma akbaru min nafi'ahima, just to metabolize it is harmful. Now they have different alcoholic contents like wine has less alcohol than like vodka, some of them are 40 proof. <laughs> no little alcohol is good in the end. Um, beer, uh, how many cans of beer, brothers and sisters, do you have to drink for you to fail a breathalyzer test? How many cans of beer does it take to fail a breathalyzer for you to be legally barred from operating a vehicle driving under the influence? How many cans of beer? One. Yeah. Exactly. One can of beer. It's all it takes for you to fill a breathalyzer. So, what's the safest limit? When you drive that car, mm. a little bit intoxicated, you don't know when you're going to kill somebody. Not no. everybody who drinks and drives, no. that, that causes a problem. But Allah says it's harmful. And all the benefits you can think about it, Allah says, is trumped by the harm. But Allah still, if you notice, did not come out and say, avoid it here. Brothers and sisters, can you think of one good reason why doesn't Allah say right now in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 215, why doesn't he say, stop drinking now? But to say, it's harmful, think about it. Why not just ban it now? Why wait for a few more years before it is banned in the last major Surah, Surah Al-Ma'idah? Who can think of one wisdom behind that? Because it's a medical issue with alcohol withdrawal. Yes, Jazakallah khairan. Because it's an addiction, substance abuse. Allah knows if you just ban it, people don't have enough time to change. They need enough iman. So Allah gradually say, hey, alcohol is harmful. Later on, Allah says, don't drink and come to salah. And then finally, Allah says, quit. So Allah give believers time to fix themselves. And only Iman 
give them the courage and the strength to say intahayna to stop so you know brothers and sisters there's several things which Allah gradually prohibited in Quran there are only a few things that were just prohibited day one some things Allah gave time for people to change because substance abuse needs time to resolve and Allah is merciful and Allah knows that if day one you ban alcohol many people will never become a Muslim many of the companions were drinking in Mecca, they were drinking in Medina. When Allah banned alcohol, finally, some were like this. And then somebody came and recited the ayah, and they just poured it out. They said, you can see wine in the streets of Medina. Imagine that. In Medina, people had jugs of alcohol already made, drinking on a regular basis. When Allah revealed Al-Ma'ida towards the end of the life of the Prophet, pretty much, it was revealed, you know, towards the last year of Nubuwa. Why did Allah wait 22 years to ban it? Because people need time to change. Some people needed to know that it's very, very harmful to get rid of it. One person that did that was somebody that we should all love. Amirul Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. So hadith states, this is hadith recorded by Imam Ahmed and Abu Dawood in Al-Nasai that... Abu Maysara, see somebody's name is Maysara. Abu Maysara said that um, Umar al-Khattab that once said, Umar al-Khattab wanted Allah to actually give a definitive ruling on alcohol. So he says, oh Allah, give us a clear ruling about khamr. That's why Allah revealed, yes, alunaka anil khamri wal maysir. That people are asking now, is it good or bad? And Umar is one of the people who wanted to know. So Allah revealed this yes, So the Prophet Sallallahu sent for Umar and, and recited from the ayah. Says, what do you say now? Allah says this. You know what Umar said? Oh Allah, give us a ruling about Al-Khamr. <laughs> Umar was not satisfied with Surah Al-Baqarah's ayah because it just says it's bad, but it doesn't say quit. So then Allah later on revealed in Surah An-Nisa, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. Don't come to prayer when you're intoxicated until you are able to know what you're saying. To you know what you're saying, I mean you have to be sober. You need sobriety to pray. That's why you shouldn't pray when you're sleepy either. The sleepy and the drunk people are almost the same. Umar said, "Oh Allah, give us a ruling about" <laughs> That if people can drink and not come to Salah, it means that they can drink. Okay. Then when Allah SWT finally revealed Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu innam al-khamru wal-maysir wal-ansab wal-azlam rijzu min amal Allah says this is the abominable works of shaitan. Fajtanibu. Abandon it completely. Then Umar says, Intahayna. Now we can quit. See, Umar, he wanted Allah to be clear unequivocal, no room for any if, ands, or buts. Allah says, it is the work of shaitan, fajtanibu. So brothers and sisters, in sharia, al-ijtinaba is the highest form of prohibition. It's the highest form of prohibition. If, uh, it's saying something is haram, it's bad. Saying fajtanibu means it's worse, that you can't even come near it. That's why you should not grow grapes for the purpose of selling it to a winery. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said seven people, or seven categories or so, or it could be even ten in one hadith, they're all guilty of the sin of khamr. We'll deal with that later. But the one who grows the grapes for that purpose, the farmer who grows it for that purpose, the one that picks it, the one that transports it, the one that ferments it, <laughs> that distills it, the one that sells it, the one that serves it and the one that drinks it, they're all part of the supply chain. I need to something. It's a harmful thing. It makes billions, yes. But guess how much money alcohol caused the alcohol consumption, the negative effects. Guess how much it costs us in healthcare and all of that? Nearly $300 billion. So the actual cost, the human toll, is higher than the monetary benefit that people are getting from it. It can be actually proven economically that it's bad. It can be proven medically that it's bad, that all the benefits are trumped by the harm. The number one cause 
of household abuse is alcohol, substance abuse, not just alcohol, substances, any intoxicants and stuff, whether it's drugs or alcohol. Number one, leading cause for, uh, you know, spousal abuse or household abuse, you name it. It is also a leading cause of cancers in men and women. It is a leading cause for road accidents. There's no quantification of the human toll. And it puts a lot of strain in our healthcare system. Allah says, I know, you don't know. But Omar said, oh Allah, be more specific by saying, oh Allah, give us a ruling so that it ends. Because again, in Al-Baqarah, Allah did not prohibit it. Allah says it's bad. He left it up to believers to quit on their own so some people quit. Then Allah says, don't come to Salah when you're drunk. So when they used to make Adhan, they would announce, whoever has drunk, don't come near our prayers. <laughs> we'll go more into about that in Swat and Nisa. And then finally Allah says, quit. And everybody quit in Tahina. Any question about Al Khamr and Al Maisir? Alcohol and gambling? Any questions? Um, I have one question. Yes. Is the stock market considered gambling? Say it again, the stock market? Is the stock market considered gambling? Good question. The stock market is trading. Although it involves some risk, it is actually trading. So the stock market is that companies that are publicly traded, they decided to divide some of their value into shares. So a person can buy a share in a company like Apple, Microsoft, and where. So when those companies make profit, they're supposed to, that increases the value of your share. So if you sell it, you make a profit as well in general. However, the stock market is not just tech companies. It is the alcohol industry, the swine industry. Many other bad industries are publicly traded companies. So they're all part of the stock market. So you can pick and choose where your stocks go. Government bonds, for example, are loans which the U.S. government is, is you know, pretty much soliciting through bonds. So you buy a government bond, you're giving government money, and then later on government pays you interest. So not every stock is halal and bonds are certainly not because you're just gonna get interest from the government. So an, an investor needs to know, make sure that they're investing in a halal business or in a halal industry. Uh, but it's not gambling in any sense of the term, gambling. Yes, you do take a risk. Investments always have a risk. Um, but you don't make money through yourself by chance. It is actually a predictable uh, system to make you benefit from it. Yes, you could lose the value of your stocks. That could happen, but it's designed to make you win. Everybody who invests should get a return, except when there's a calamity. So to answer your question simply, the stock market as it is designed isn't gambling, per se, but not every stock is halal. So you should not buy stocks in the pork industry. You shouldn't buy stocks for like Miller, the company that makes Bud Light and all the stuff. But Budweiser makes Bud Miller has Miller Light too. You get an idea that, you know, you see these companies like, you know, Anheuser-Busch, they sometimes they publicly trade. You can buy tech stocks. You can buy stocks in Microsoft. They sell technology or Apple sell technology a lot of google they sell technology we don't know what else they do but some companies sell again haram stuff you cannot you should not invest in the gaming industry stocks uh, so so when it comes to making investment we need to find halal portfolio so some companies do that they, they actually they, they i forgot the name of a muslim company that was tracking mutual funds that are companies that are in non-haram businesses so to invest in. I forgot the name of it. I, I hope I find it. But yes, you can pick and choose where your stocks go. Avoid bonds, Wahid. state tax. Say that again. Wahid Investment. It's one of those. Yeah, they have another one prior to that even. Uh, but yeah, so we have several that are tracking and then they're making it possible. So that's very, very good that you understand that. You know, in the modern world is kind of confusing, mm -hmm. but alcohol and gambling is pretty clear. Um, so here's the second part. Uh, I'm yes. sorry, brother. As you said, the lottery also comes in this category. 
Oh, of course, the lottery is gambling for sure. The, the, <laughs> the scr whether you're scratching for the numbers, whether you're pulling the lever, whether you're buying the lucky number. And I heard somebody says, oh, brother, if I win the lottery, I can build a lot of masjid with it. You want to build a masjid with lottery money? I mean, in Allah tayyib. Allah is pure, doesn't it? Only accept halal. You cannot take lottery money to build masajid. In fact, Allah mm. will curse a person for doing so. I hear people say, brother, if I win this, I'm going to build masajid. I'm going to build Islamic schools. It's like, brother, are you trying to anger Allah? If Allah tells you something haram, don't say I'm going to go get it and do good with it. <laughs> mm. Abstain from it. What about credit cards? Uh, when, Those when are we, oh, so we that's different. Us, that's zakat, a different. When we, we pay and sadaqa, we use credit card. This is oh. as I also interest in it. Well, true, but so you know, the interest you pay in credit card is if you don't pay your bill. That's why you have a grace period. So that's another iffy one. We'll table that when we get to the interest ayah. In Surah Al Baqarah, we're going to talk about the interest ayah and the debt ayah. We have to cover the debt ayah, 282. But summary, so the question is, can I use a credit card to, to give sadaqa? Can I borrow money to temporarily? Because that's what you do. When you swipe your card, you're borrowing money from the credit card company, promising to pay it within the grace period of 25 plus days. If you don't, then they charge you the interest on that purchase. See, so some people, they pay off their, their, their balances all the time. Some people don't have the discipline or they don't have the funds to do it. So that's a tricky question because it has a lot of nuances to it. So technically, can a person use a credit card to give a sadaqa to pay back? Technically, yes, if they can pay that, that amount off before it earns interest. But some scholars go further. They say that the credit card itself system is a haram system because it's based on interest. There's an interest clause. That is for the scholars to debate because they have a different opinion. Because it's an interest clause. There's some people who have an, a credit card that they don't pay any interest on it because they pay off the balances. You see what I'm saying? Well, oh, you use it as a debit. Uh, well, debits are debits. So debit is going straight out of your bank account without a problem. Uh, but a credit card is certainly not a debit card. But you can have a debit card that could act like a credit card. Uh, the way they process the transaction. So without complicating it now, I'm going to leave the details for this very good question of yours for the interest ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, riba. We have to talk about that, inshallah. Okay? So this part B of the question was, They ask you about what, they, about what they're spending. And so Allah says, what should you be spending of well, it takes spending from so before it's who should receive spending now it's from what part of your wealth should you be spending from the questions uh, the answer Allah says the extra the part that goes beyond what your needs are okay so a, a man asked the Prophet and this was uh, recorded Imam Muslim recorded that Jabir said that the Prophet Sallallahu said to a man a man asked the Prophet Sallallahu um where should I spend money? The Prophet has told this man, Ibda binafsik, start with yourself. You know, spend on yourself. And if anything remains from that, then on your family. Then your relatives. And if anything is left, you know, from that you left then upon this and upon that, you just you spend charity begins with yourself at home, relatives and others as a general practice. And again, it is the extra that you have. So you pay zakah on the extra money or wealth or assets you have saved for a year. I'm going to leave that question because, uh, I'm at my limit. Any questions about Khamur and Maisir, the sacred months, and what to spend? Always spend on your mother, then your father, sisters, then your brothers, then those who are closest and closer. 
Uh, about the gambling. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, but you know how in arcades they have games that have to do with chance? Give an example of a game that is a yeah. chance game. Chance game. A real example. Uh, like Chuck E. Cheese or like spin the wheel. Oh, those type of just that do virtual money. Allahu alam. Those don't count as gambling. gambling. Allah knows best because you buy tickets to play these games. We can have a, a there's a difference. Say, is wasting time in Chuck E. Cheese is a, a good thing to do? <laughs> That's a different question of being at the arcade, but just some of these kind of arcade games, although you buy money, coins to play arcade or to buy tickets in Chuck E. Cheese's, Allah knows best. That they don't count in the traditional sense of gambling. You're not, gonna, you're not doing it to earn money. You're not going to win money uh, out of this. You win tickets. You win stuff like that, prizes, and, and Allah knows best. But they don't count generally. But I talk about like lottery tickets and scratch games that you find in the gas stations and stuff. Those are generally clearly... Uh, gambling, but video games that give virtual monies or arcade games where people earn prizes and stuff. Oh, that was best. Good question, nonetheless. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. We have other forms of gambling, by the way. Like people, like people bet in sports. I don't know that there's a lot of sports gambling. People gamble to see who wins, you know, a series. Um, Kentucky Derby. People gamble on which horse will win. Yes, people will gamble on who wins the race. There's a lot of money to be made in the gambling, you know. People gamble sometimes who wins the uh, boxing match between Mike Tyson and Floyd Mayweather. There are a lot of times and ways people gamble. Um, you think People think there's a benefit. Everybody's a loser except the one who wins. So, inshallah, they should be avoided. But never think that by winning the lottery, you're going to build massage don't but even... about the betting that if somebody has some friends or people, two, two, two people that are betting on something that say, if you do that, then I will give you that much money. This, that's a good question about betting. Um, betting isn't gambling, especially since Abu Bakr was a bet with somebody about room winning. <laughs> and the professor told him to increase your wager in that bet or to effect, uh, betting is kind of like, it's hard to tell wh what people are betting on. But yeah, like two people say, okay, if if Ramadan starts tomorrow, I'm going to pay you $1,000. If it doesn't, you pay me $1,000. It's not a game, but it's, it's certainly a thing, a chance. I'll look, I'll look deeper into it to see if scholars say that all betting is haram. Not all betting is haram, by the way. Again, Abu Bakr Siddiq betted on room so an Allah reveals what room, Ghulibati room, fi anna al-ardi wa hum min ba'di ghalabihim sayaglibun. So betting is questionable. Um, I'll try to find if there's any clear-cut ruling about betting um, being completely haram or not. But some betting isn't haram already, um, as in the case when Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, made a bet with somebody that about the room. And that's one of the reasons why so the room was revealed. Good question. Alhamdulillah. All right. It is 3.35. Alhamdulillah. Can I ask one quick question, please? Sure. Yes. I'm going back to um, alcohol. Mm -hmm. You mentioned whosoever is selling it, you're serving it, mm -hmm. you know, it's around. How about if you happen to be within an environment, like a gathering where alcohol is being served? Yeah, so that's where scholars, they give recommendations, people to isolate themselves, not to be in the table where other people are drinking, stay away from those type of people, because sometimes you cannot isolate yourself. For example, you go to a regular restaurant, it's a family restaurant, but then they serve alcohol in the restaurant, in the bar area, or some people buy it, they bring it to their table to sell it. In those situations, it's really hard for you to isolate yourself, except you can be on your own table, don't sit at the bar, drink your stuff, don't go to restaurants that primarily sell alcohol, but most... Most restaurants except the Muslim ones. So it's an iffy situation now. But in general, avoid gatherings where, for example, if there's a gathering where primarily people are drinking, avoid it by all possible means. But sometimes you have a, for example, an educational gathering. It was a graduation. And after the graduation, they start serving people champagne. You don't drink the champagne. You'll just pass on that. You know? So you, it's hard for you to avoid the gathering. 
because somebody might serve champagne there. So we just have to use our best judgment about the general principle is not to sit with people disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, that's generally what the, uh, the recommendations are. Avoid sitting somewhere where people could be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, Allah has never punished the people just drinking alcohol by themselves, not to say they may not be cursed. Otherwise, um, Las Vegas will be underneath the sea right now. Sin City. So we just have to use good judgment. Sometimes at work, your company would order food and then there's some alcohol still served, although there's regular food, halal food, even if you want. It's also kind of hard to maneuver, but just use your best judgment where you, wherever you are. Always look at your surroundings. Make sure that the primary purpose of people coming together, drinking is not the primary purpose. Make sure that if there are people sitting in a table and many of them are drinking, I think you should remove yourself from there and go somewhere else um, and, and so on and so forth to each their own based on your ability and a lot of those best. I know sometimes like with family gatherings, friends, weddings, those occasions can be of yes, a challenge, can. especially yes, they can. They if can. you're being seated and probably there is not a spot left for you to be. That is true. It's very difficult. So watch your surroundings preemptively uh, isolate yourself. Don't wait for you to be cornered by the drinking people. You go choose your nice spot. And if they come and sit next to you, then you, it's beyond your control at that point. So sometimes I do that, you know, preemptive isolation. <laughs> so that way I don't have to deal with the drinkers. Um, but yes, it's a challenge, not only in the West, everywhere, except a few places in the world. If you think there's no drinking happening, in every, every country of the world, you're sadly mistaken. There is drinking. Alcohol is available everywhere. It's at the airports of Muslim countries, by the way. Yeah. Some Muslim countries in the Gulf, they pride themselves. You can go to a bar and drink if you want to and not drink if you don't want to. So it's hard. It's hard to completely avoid the gatherings and we ask Allah to save us and protect us just do your best mm -hmm. and Allah yeah. knows everybody's heart and Allah yeah. knows some we don't intend to disobey sometimes we just cannot run away <laughs> from all this fitna any further questions and comments I have, about... one, I have one question can sure. you hear me yes um me, <clears throat> I am a nurse and we have a patient who is drinking alcohol and I have the key so I told my supervisor that I don't want to charge alcohol. So sometimes the way she does, you know, it's like you put God before your job. I said, no, I said, I don't want to charge alcohol. So I will ask some of my friends. I gave them the key so they will go and get the alcohol for the patient. Yeah, that is a very tough situation wherein um, somebody who wants to drink alcohol, I just, I find it very interesting that they're allowing a patient to drink alcohol. Uh, is it because, the, uh, anyway, without discussing the patient's you know, health, and, you know, it's, I find it very interesting that a medical facility or at least a, a caretaking facility will allow a patient or a tenant, sometimes it's a nursing home, you know, just a bunch of people there who their parents, who their, their kids don't want to take care of them, they just dump them there. So they may be allowed to sip a little bit. Yes, preemptively find someone else to do it on your behalf and i'm glad that you had the courage to tell them hey you know for religious purposes i should not be the one serving alcohol to a person I, it's against my faith so but whoever else is brave enough to go do it i think that's a good approach to let employers know that hey, i have a problem with this faith wise i should not be the one serving the person alcohol it's their right to drink it but it's not it's not my obligation to serve it thank you yeah. Sometimes it's a flight attendant, a Muslim flight attendant. You're in a flight. Whether it is any of the Gulf Airlines, they serve alcohol to people who ever want it. You know, then how does a flight attendant deal with that? A Muslim praying flight attendant to go pour wine for a non-Muslim. In a Gulf Airline. And I'm not need to name their names. I'm just letting you know. That's how problematic it has become. May Allah save us. May Allah help us with all these difficult challenges. I'm just trying to tell you that even if you live in a Muslim country, you will be subjected to this type of stuff. Um, I'm, uh, assalamu alaikum. One more question. Sure. 
um, I know we have so many Muslims that, you know, have gas station and they sell alcohol inside. Yes, How true. the approach to the, you know. That is a very difficult thing. So if you have a franchise of 7-Eleven or Exxon, Mobile, any of these, they do sell gambling and alcohol. That is a very big deal. And I would advise every Muslim owner to think very carefully about having a store or a franchise where alcohol and gambling is sold. Because not all of the earnings of that store is haram. It's just a small portion sometimes. People come there to buy gas or stuff, you know. It's just that a person will be questioning Yom Kama for it to buy a loss upon our Thailand. And if they directly profit from that and they consume it, it will be very it could be very bad for them. So I'd advise any Muslim who would like to invest in a franchise of any kind or any business that will require them to serve alcohol. I mean, imagine if you have a gas station that has no alcohol <laughs> and people come and gas once like, oh, I'm not coming here again. You know, <laughs> because people just buy stuff like that when they come to gas their car. So mm. I pray to Allah that we have enough Muslim gas stations where there's no alcohol and, to, and they have enough patrons anyway. But yeah, it's a very serious matter that I think a Muslim owner should really think hard. Do you want some of your earnings to come from haram sources, clearly haram sources? How do you explain that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You cannot say Allah didn't have enough risk. The reason why you have a franchise is because you have enough money to buy into a franchise. You know, so... You know, may Allah judge us all lightly, but I will not advise a Muslim to get into any franchise un unless they can say, I can choose not to put this alcohol here. You know, so. Jazakumullah mm khairan, -hmm. brothers and sisters. I always love this type of um, spirited discussions. Look, we're not the only ones who had these questions. These questions were from 1400 years ago. That means someone else was thinking about it. And I'm really glad that Allah provided the answers. And at this stage, some of the answers are not a prohibition yet, but it will come later on. So we stopped in question number five, A and B. On Wednesday, inshallah, we will finish it with questions six and seven, inshallah. Question number Inham six is about the orphans and question number seven about women. Yes, did somebody have a question? Yes, yes. Um, we'll go back to insurance. <laughs> yeah, so for um, insurance, we have to... Yes. So what is the question about insurance? The question is, I know you said um, a Muslim should not get life insurance, but what if a Muslim is selling life insurance? I would not advise a Muslim to sell something that they should not be getting in the first place. Um, it's just difficult when you work for an insurance company that sell different types of insurances. Uh, for example, car insurance is mandated upon everyone. But life insurance is not a mandate. Talk about a legal mandate by a state or a government. Life insurance is not a requirement. So a person has to, to buy into it if they want to. I would not advise a person to sell life insurance. Um, just because nature of life insurance, it's another... Uh, it doesn't insure you from death. It's a wrong, sometimes I hear imams and scholars say, life insurance is haram because no one can insure it. The purpose of any insurance is not to prevent the risk that you're insuring against. It's so that you can, how do you provide when the risk happens? How do you pay for your car repairs when a car accident happens? That's the purpose of having car insurance. What happens if you have an accident and you kill somebody, accident, who pays for that death or the medical expense it comes from insurance policy? But with life insurance, people take it so that way their family members will have the house paid off, the cars paid off, and some of the debts paid off. The problem with it is that people collect more than they put in. You will rarely find somebody with a million-dollar life insurance policy paying a million dollars into it before they died. It rarely ever happens. So you're collecting other people's money when you die. That's what's wrong about it in concept. It could be other things run, you know, technical things like the contracting of it. And what, so ask yourself a question. When we give monies, we pay premiums to life insurance, you know, insurance companies. What happens to that money? Guess what? They take it and invest it. That's so they grow the money. That's why insurance companies always seem to have money to pay for damages or they deny your claim. They put certain conditions that make you, they make them deny your claim. So they keep your money, they invest it, 
but they don't give you a, a return on the investment. They don't give you, ever give you back your premiums. See, so they're cheating you. That's why it's wrong. They cheat you, the insured. They take from other people's monies to pay for damages. That's why it's wrong, okay? So I wouldn't advise a person to sell life insurance. But if they're in a business that already sells life insurance, I ask a lot to give them a better job. So people should have good near to do things halal, and may Allah help them to get out of it. You know, similar to somebody working in a in a bank, but they do different things. They service loans versus someone who's just a teller. These things are kind of difficult in the world today. And you know, we Allah Allah looks at each of each and every single one of our condition to see who's needy, who's not. We cannot prejudge everybody, honestly speaking, uh, because, you know, and Allah is also forgiving. Allah can tell that somebody is really struggling and suffering, and this is all they have right now. So if they have a niyyah to change it, Allah will give them something better by his rahmah. Okay? All right. So let us then um, adjourn for today, and we ask Allah to educate us and edify us by what we've heard today, and we ask Allah to grant us the tawfiq to implement his commandments. And we ask Allah to forgive us where we falter and with our shortcomings. We ask Allah to forgive all our sins whenever we transgress this willfully or unwillfully. Um, we ask Allah to, to look at us mercifully. You know, the 21st century is a difficult time to live. If you, if you think 1400 years ago was hard, it was hard because of the weather and there's no AC. Now, there are a lot of things that challenge us, interest, mortgages, credit, you name it. A whole bunch of things that we cannot even escape from anymore. Who, who can buy a house cash money? Most of us are not that wealthy. So we have to borrow money. And you know what? Allah knows your need when you do that. So, but we ask Allah always to forgive us, to enrich us with wisdom and enlightenment. And we ask Allah to forgive us, you know, so that when we stand in front of him, he will just say, enter Jannah, I forgive you. And that's all we can hope for. So brothers and sisters, keep on coming to class. Invite your family members to spread the khayr to them. Because, you know, if everybody learns, then we'll all have less questions. And um, at the end of the day, learning is only important if you can live by it. In Islam, we don't learn knowledge abstractly. You learn to implement, to ask Allah to give us all the opportunity to willfully and you know, implement his deen and to make it easy upon us and also to never make us extremists upon other people. We ask Allah to make us wise callers to the truth and that we should never alienate our family members when we advise them, but we should show them compassion. Even if they're wrong and even if they insult us, if you want somebody to change, you have to be like Prophet Muhammad you have to be willing to tolerate their insults to help them see the truth. You can never guide those whom you love, but you can show them the way, inshallah. So may Allah accept from us this, these sessions. May Allah make them heaviest on our scales. May Allah change yeah. our lives by them. Inna Allah malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayu alladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'una bima allamtana wa zidna ilma ya rabbal alameen. اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره لنا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان وجعلنا من الراشدين فضلا منك ورحمة يا أرحم الراحمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المبسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خيرا see you on Wednesday evening 9 p.m. after Maghrib إن شاء الله